So I, uh, I wanted to first off just jump in and ask you about or to react to sort of the reports today about the president and uh, contacting multiple contacts with the president of Ukraine, <coughs> uh, sort of applying some pressure to uh, investigate Joe Biden's son, I believe, is the, was the main uh, gist of that. What, what, what's your reaction to that whole saga? If that is true, it's a betrayal of our country. And one of the reasons we have Congress is to provide oversight in situations like this. The fact that Congress is being stonewalled uh, when a whistleblower complaint has been raised, I think, is very telling and very concerning. And I hope that every legal mechanism is used to make sure that Congress finds out what happened. Uh, remember, we're not talking about making anything public that's classified. We're talking about people who are already legally responsible for uh, assessing these kinds of allegations in a secure environment. And I think they deserve to know what happened and uh, to handle it on behalf of the American people. Are you concerned that, as with some of these other stories during the Trump presidency, that the stonewalling will work, that we won't get to know what happened? You know, there's something about the volume and the, the level of scandal in this administration. If it was just one or two of these scandals, I think it could end an administration. But when it's one or two a week, it just overloads our capacity for outrage. It's one of the reasons why, even though I very strongly believe that Congress needs to do something about this and that there needs to be accountability, uh, I've also come to realize that the best thing I can do about this situation is to work to defeat this president, to uh, work on the assumption that he will be the president in November 2020 and do everything in my power to make sure that we win. And I also think if there is a powerful rejection at the ballot box, not just for this kind of shocking behavior, but for Republicans in Congress who know better, who are enabling it, I think that's what it will take to bring about a national reckoning, uh, not only uh, for the benefit of, of my party and, and our party's ideals, but frankly, the Republican Party has some serious thinking to do about what it has come on board with and whether uh, they're going to continue accepting what amounts to a betrayal, not just of my values, but of their own. I want to see something about uh, domestic policy. Um, there's been some criticism uh, in your hometown of South Bend, where you're the mayor, about policing issues from members of uh, from people of color in your community. Um, as president, or even as for the rest of this campaign, um, how do you plan to kind of repair your relationship with racial justice advocates? Well, this is a real challenge in our community, and we're not perfect, but we've also done a ton of good work that that we're proud of in order to heal divisions and deal with the sources of mistrust, especially between law enforcement and communities of color. Uh, it's motivated and informed my plan for dealing with systemic racist, uh, racism and institutional racism at a national level. Because uh, for all the work that's gone at, on at the local level, I've also seen the limits of what can happen when we live in a system where not just things like policing and criminal justice, but everything from housing to education to, to voting is impacted by the racial reality that we live in. It's why I've proposed a systemic approach, the Douglas Plan, which has gotten high marks, uh, including from, from a lot of black activists, is the most comprehensive plan offered by a 2020 candidate. Uh, and I understand the urgency of doing it because of how so many of these issues have played out in my community. Uh, I think I have a responsibility to make sure that we get that message out uh, because it's, it's well received when we communicate it. But there are a lot of voters who even now are still just getting to know us. And um, I think South Bend has experienced the same problems as a lot of communities across the country have. Um, in, East, in Eastern Iowa, we've had um, frustrations with policing policy and things like that. Um, do you think that is um, that as president that the federal government should be uh, mandating police practices, incentivizing pr police practices, or just letting local governments manage that? I think there's a mix. We definitely need an active civil rights division at the Justice Department to step in where there are violations that require enforcement. But there can also be a lot of partnerships. In fact, we benefited under the last administration from partnerships when we were wrestling with some of these issues locally. I knew that the White House and the Department of Justice were uh, going to be friends and, and, uh, and be helpful to any mayor trying to do the right thing. Uh, they had a 21st century policing task force, for example, that had some of the most respected pe voices on racial justice and on policing working uh, to create ideas and, and best practices and resources for local communities. Uh, that died completely when this administration took office. The reality is uh, we have a lot of work to do at the local level, but uh, we also have a lot of work to do at the federal level. And we can't expect mayors across America or departments or communities to handle this alone when there are so many issues, not just around things like uh, the justice system, but things like economic disempowerment uh, that uh, cannot be separated from uh, the way that, that race has 
caused uh, so many harms in our society. And if we, I find every time we sit down at the table to work some of these issues at home, at the beginning of the hour we're talking about policing and criminal justice. By the end of the hour we're talking about that, and we're talking about economic issues. Uh, all of these things are connected, which is why all of them need a systematic approach. So there's a lot of discussion about preventing climate change. Obviously that's an urgent goal. Here in Cedar Rapids we know that climate change is already happening. It's had effects. We've had a couple of large floods in the last 10 years. Uh, so what sort of ideas and resources would you put into sort of <coughs> protection, mitigation, disaster response? How would your administration change the way that that's, that works? Well, one thing that was striking in Cedar Rapids, and I actually mentioned it earlier today on national television, was the way that the community came together and worked to deliver the kind of, not just disaster prepared, uh, response, but the kind of preparedness for future flooding that's going on right now. Uh, I think, uh, again, this is a case where communities should not be asked to do it alone. And so in addition to the urgent work we need to do to deliver a carbon neutral economy by 2050 so that we stop uh, the acceleration of these climate trends, we also got to face the fact that they're coming no matter what. Uh, one of the things that impressed me in this area was that there were a lot of steps taken to support uh, those who wanted to relocate without too heavy of a hand on that. And I think we should look at ways that uh, the federal government can support people who are thinking about resilience and thinking about uh, things like floodplains in a way, uh, in a more responsive way to the realities of the future, while at the same time supporting and honoring the preferences of local communities, trying to do this in a way that's right for them. And it's why I propose that the federal government invest in regional resilience hubs, where a lot of the decision making is local, but it's backed by federal dollars. What would that look like as far as a regional hub? Would it go according to the FEMA regions or or how would that be structured? You know, one of the things that uh, I found very powerful in economic development is self-defined regions. Now, that's uh, not familiar language for the federal government, which likes to cut up states uh, into predictable areas, but I think it might be the, the best way to do it, actually. In other words, the region is whoever pulls together to put in for the funding. Uh, we had a model like that work very well for an economic development uh, effort in South Bend. And the value of that is uh, sometimes uh, county lines or uh, municipal lines can be misleading in terms of what really constitutes a community of interest. And we need to promote that kind of regionalism uh, because more and more communities are finding that their, their real rivalries aren't with their immediate neighbors the way we used to think of it, uh, but sometimes with a, a community in China uh, that's half a world away. And so not just in terms of the resilience projects, but in terms of economic development, supporting innovation more generally. We really need to support, I think, that regional model. So that's water quantity. Hmm. As far as water quality, how, what would you, how would you address the kind of the sorry state of water quality in the United States? Well, look, any mayor thinks a lot about water quality because you're in charge of delivering clean, safe drinking water. And what we know is that for all the debates going on about infrastructure, the focus on what you might call the sexier topics of airports and, uh, and high-speed rail and highways, a lot of the most important infrastructure in this country is underground. Uh, it's only functioning if it's functioning so well that you never have to think about it. And we've seen that that's not the case. So in order to act, we need to make sure that a real 21st century infrastructure plan contemplates the needs for upgrades, not just with water, but with wastewater. Here in the Midwest, we've got a lot of issues with sewer separation. In our city, that amounts to a billion dollar mandate with no dollars uh, behind it in order to allow us to get it done. Now, what we've done locally is innovated uh, using technology that was developed in our community to cut hundreds of millions of dollars off the cost to get the same environmental benefit or better. But the federal system doesn't really know how to accommodate that yet. So we need a model that's responsive to the w good local work that's going on. But we also just plain have to come up with some dollars and some resources. I think we also need to look at how we can support agriculture in farming in more sustainable ways. We have a conservation stewardship program. We have an environmental quality incentive program in the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, but I don't think that they're being funded the way they could to really support instead of just pressure farmers into being able to take advantage of farming techniques that are conducive to cleaner water but don't necessarily pencil out. If we can find billions and billions of dollars just to pay for the damage being done by the trade war and the tariffs, as J.D. Scholten puts it, uh, borrowing money from China in order to pay farmers to not pay, uh, sell their goods to China, surely we can find more resources to invest cooperatively with farmers in making sure that our practices are leading the way globally on uh, sustainability and clean water. Let me ask you just one more thing on that subject. Um, in Iowa, ethanol is very important to a lot of people, although there's some people that have concerns about um, incentivizing the production of so much corn and other um, maybe un unintended consequences. Where are you at on that? 
I think that ethanol is a very important part of the economy and of our past toward a more sustainable future. Uh, look, uh, no matter how aggressive your plans are, we are going to need, uh, at the very least, ships, planes, and in the near term, uh, vehicles uh, operating on liquid fuel. And ethanol can be a huge part of that in addition to the economic benefit. Now, unfortunately, under this administration, they are favoring large oil companies with these so-called small refinery waivers, and small should have a big asterisk on it, and uh, have, have really, I think, double-crossed a lot of people in areas like this and areas like where I live, where we grow a lot of corn, uh, that supported this administration only to really be slapped in the face with the policies when it comes to ethanol and, and these refineries. Uh, thank you, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, for joining us here in Cedar Rapids. Sure thing. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Thank you.